Um, he is just an incredible voice, an incredible advocate, and the person I look to when I think this work is too big and too much and I cannot do it anymore. The voices that Terrence has given life to remind me that we have to keep going. We have to keep doing this work because if they can keep going, we can keep going. And so I'm thrilled to introduce my friend Terrence Lester, and he's going to share with you a little bit about the work he does here. How's everybody doing? Well, I have a lot of energy. Um, pardon my. My voice is a little raspy because we have uh, this weather change. But I, before I get started, I wanted to just say, man, thank you uh, to Joanne, Susan, and Jamie, and the entire uh, network for allowing me to share my personal story uh, in this laboratory of social scientists. Uh, I'm really inspired. And as a matter of fact, this morning, I was telling my son, he's seven years old, and he has this crazy imagination. And I say, I'm going to uh, speak at a, a national diaper bank network, and he gives me this side eye, like, you're in the diapers now? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the diapers, because every diaper uh, matters, and every diaper counts, right? And so, uh, this morning, I want to start, but I want to ask you if I can be a little vulnerable. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. What if I told you that the very first time I ever heard somebody tell me that, Terrence, you're going to be a leader, it was from somebody who was homeless. I'll never forget um, the day it happened. I was standing outside of an alternative school less than two miles away from me. The night before, 16 and a half years old, I just slept in a park. I was 16 years old, I ran away from home, and I told my mom that I'm not coming back here because I was still dealing with a lot of the social trauma stemming uh, from my house. And I'm standing out here, and it was this day. It was kind of cool. It was in the winter time. It was early morning, and I'm walking away from this alternative school with a group of my peers, and I tell them, man, I just can't do it anymore. And all of a sudden, it's this man standing in the faint distance, and he asked me to come over. I was the only one to respond at that time. I'm 16 and a half years old, and I see this guy, and I have this heart full of empathy, and I started to walk towards him. I walk over to this man. He's in his middle, he's middle-aged man, a little in his late 50s, and he has trash hanging from his beard. He looks like he hasn't showered in about two months, and he says, young man, do you go to that school over there? And I remember looking at him, and I said, yeah. It's the school I go to. He says, whatever you do, don't drop out of school. He says, whatever you do, you got to go back to school because one day, just one day, maybe you'll be a leader. And I kept thinking to myself, living on the streets calls me over to him and has the ability to tell me that one day I would be a leader. It baffled my mind because he did not know that I grew up in a household watching domestic violence happen to my mom. He did not know that I didn't have any male role models in my life to tell me, young man, do this or young man, do that. He didn't know that I was a young man, 16 and a half years old, sleeping in a park on a park bench the night before, really in a position willing to literally give it all up. And that morning, he stopped me and he says, you have more to offer this life. And I'll never forget that conversation because that's the conversation that literally became the pivotal point in my life. 
I walked away from this man and I said, man, I have to give more of myself to my life. There has to be more in my life. There has to be more. There has to be greater role models. There have to be greater environments. There has to be. And I'll never forget, I had a substitute teacher at the time pull me aside and he says, Terrence, you have talents and gifts and abilities. You can speak and you can write. And yet at the time, I could not see my worth and my own value. And here it is. It's this guy who was volunteering at the school and sometimes a substitute teacher and a homeless man saw me. And for the first time in my life, I heard that I could be something. I could be something. Many of the people that we serve on a week to week basis need to hear that they matter and that they can be something. I'll never forget going back to school. I dropped out for a period of time, but I mustered up enough strength to overcome all of the limitations that were in my family and in the men in my family. And I said, I've got to be something. I went back and graduated. I didn't get a GED. I went back and I graduated. And once I graduated, I started to think about my life and all the pains in my life. I read one time in a book that sometimes pain can lead you to your greatest destiny. And so I looked at the canvas of my life and I said, what is it, is it do I have to offer this life? Where can I go with my life? What has pained me in my life that has caused the empathy on the inside of me where I can give of myself back to this life? And I started to make the change, little bit by little bit. And the jails that I was locked up in as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old juvenile, I was then going back to speak and give my story. The high school that I was put out of uh, for, 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 for teachers not being able to see past my pain, uh, I was going back to give graduation speeches at. And, and, and I learned this, uh, this, pivot, this, this principle that your story and your journey matters. Let me ask you something. What has been your story? What has been your journey? What has led you to this point? Because most of us in here, if we were to really sit you down in a room and lock you in a room by yourself and put you on a couch, put you on a couch and ask you, why are you doing the work that you do? It's some part of you, some part of your story that you'll say, man, I was broken at one point. I was hurt at one point. I saw the need at one point and it mattered so much that I wanted to give my entire life to it. I come here to remind somebody this morning that your story matters, your journey matters, and it's time for you to remember why you started. I know it's getting tough because you seem like you've left the shore of life and you find yourself in the middle of life and the middle is a tough place. The middle is a hard place because you pushed away from the shore and now you're in the middle and you've come to far to turn back, but you've come too far and you find yourself in a place where you have to keep going. Let me tell you something this morning. Your story matters and it's time for you to remember why you started. Why did you start? Why did you start helping moms? Why did you start providing for children? Why did you start uh, uh, standing up against this issue in our country that we sometimes forget called poverty? Why did you start? I come here to tell you that if you remember why you started, you'll remember why you need to refocus, recenter, and then reimagine. You'll ne you never know what can be born in your heart, can be born in your advocacy, can be born in your organization if you just took time to remember why you started. Remember why you started. I'll never forget when I was first about to start this organization called Love Beyond Laws. Uh, I was at the time in my normal routine uh, going downtown in the heart of the city. It was this bridge uh, called Tent City where all these people and individuals would literally live and house themselves in tents under this bridge. The bad thing about it was all around Tent City was affluence. 
Uh, and it spoke to the in income inequality that happens, not just in this city, but all across the nation, where you can walk out a palatial building, where you can be among people who have every access that they can have afforded to them, but walk right down the street and see people suffering. How is it that we live in a country, live in cities where gentrification happens and displaces people, but yet we build up buildings, but we forget that we need to build a people? And I remember, man, going and just hanging out there. No agenda, no task, nothing to get out. Because I wanted to befriend the people who were on the margins of society. Not because I needed to do something on my behalf to pat myself on the back. Because I wanted to befriend the people because it takes courage to live in poverty in this country. It takes courage to wake up every single day and not have enough diapers. It takes courage to live every single day and not know how a meal will hit the table for your children. It takes courage to go to school as a young kid and not have the adequate clothes and because people in your school are bullying you, you can't even connect with the lesson. It takes courage. How do I know? Because I've lived it. And I come here to tell you that your work is important. Your work matters. Your work is so pivotal in this country and it pushes back against the evil that is pervasive in this country trying to demonize and criminalize the people who need the most love and care. And so I find myself under this bridge and I befriended this guy named Kurt. And I asked him one day, because I had known him and he had known me and we were in this relationship as friends, and I said, man, uh, let me just take you, let me just take you to a shelter. It's, it's right down the street. Uh, parenthetically parked there, the shelter that I was talking about is now closed. Um, and he says, man, what, what do you want from me? I said, well, what, what do you mean? For the first time in four and a half years, Kurt tells me his story and he said, man, I've been out here. He says, four and a half years ago, I was working in corporate America and I was in a, a really bad car accident and my wife and my child died and I watched them die and I was the only survivor and I started using drugs and alcohol just to cope with how I was dealing with this crisis moment in my life and no longer could I function on my job and I found myself out here living behind a building and I'm sitting there in tears listening to his story because I had these two questions who knows about this but also who cares I'll never forget having my life transformed from this one conversation because he says to me, he says, if you, and he said, I bet you one thing, man. He said, I bet you, you won't go stay in that shelter. And then he says, I bet you one thing that in the middle of the night, because four or five hundred men sleep in this room, all in chairs, there's only one urinal and the smell is so thick you can taste it. He said, it's most more comfortable on the back side of a building than it is in one of our shelters in our city. And I'll never forget leaving that conversation inspired. I go home, I'm sitting down with my wife, my kids, and uh, my wife asks me, she says, what's, what's going on? I, I say, um, well, I, just, I was talking to Kurt, and he challenged me, and I, I feel like I need to do something. And she says, well, do what? I says, I think I'm supposed to live as a homeless person in our city. Uh, for an extended amount of time. She says, what? <laughs> I say, yeah, I, I literally want to take off my shoes and literally walk in the shoes of those that we are daring to serve. Because it's one thing to serve a person and still maintain the distance, but it's a whole other level if you walk in the shoes of those that you're daring to serve so you can understand life from their perspective. Amen. All right, let me. I'll never forget her and my kids dropping me off under a bridge uh, with no change of clothes, uh, no toothbrush, uh, no socks, nothing. Just took myself and the cell phone uh, to document the experience. And this blue tent on the right is the one that my homeless, for my friends experience of homelessness, rallied together to get me. They rallied together uh, to get me blankets. I remember uh, the first night, it was cold, just like it is outside. 
and I was talking on my cell phone, like having all of these notes, uh, sharing this story uh, publicly, because sometimes it's hard for people to like really uh, empathize unless they see something, somebody that they know that is close to them going through it. And so I posted this picture. I said, it's nearing the teens tonight. There's a wind chill. It's also raining. It was about 1 or 2 in the morning. And I can't sleep because the tent is sitting on jagged rocks. And so I go outside of the tent, and I'm talking to my friend named Tony. I say, bro, like, how do you, how is, <clears throat> how do you stay warm out here? He goes to his tent, uh, and Mark goes to his tent, and Tasha goes to their, her tent, her and her son. Her son was in high school. And they all get all these donated clothes. And we stood around this fire. And Mark starts this fire, and one by one, they all toss the donated clothes into the fire. And it done on me. That if you're experiencing homelessness, there's, there's no thermostat you can walk over to. There's nothing you can do to control the elements or the temperature. Literally, I was standing in front of what uh, people experiencing homelessness use as created firewood. I was standing in a fire around the fire with donated clothes being burned. And to make matters worse, very next day we woke up, we walked over two miles just to try to find the shower, and when we came back, G Dot had moved, removed all of the stuff. And many of my friends lost their like Tony, his medication that he was using under this bridge just for a life source. All sorts of things. And I began to change <coughs> and see that. Yeah, a pair of socks may just be a pair of socks, or a diaper may just be a diaper to some people, but to others, it's a lifeline. I began to brush my teeth out of water bottles, and I remember standing on a street corner here in our city begging for dollars with one of my friends experiencing a homes. And people would walk by and make these sharp comments and have judgments, and didn't even know that I wasn't homeless. And I, I never forget, just repeatedly, over and over and over, imagine hearing you don't have any worth over 400 times, back to back to back to back, when people pass you by. We asked over 427 people for a dollar, and only got 11. I count. Because I wanted to see. And little did the people know on this side uh, of, of the playing field that we were literally uh, ready begging and raising money for my friend to get medication that was just taken away from him because everybody came and swept everything away from under the bridge. And I just, I want to, I started to think, man, like, what can I, can I do? How can I continue to advocate? And I, I, this principle is it's like what you bring to the table matters. It, it, see, in this work, it's not about how big you are. It's not about how, 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 how the numbers all, 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 all the time. And, and I'm, the reason why I'm saying this is because every one person matters. If you reach enough one uh, ones, then you'll get to what it is that you're trying to get to in terms of your personal goal. But what you bring to the table matters. Let me ask you, what is it that you bring to the table? Is it your ability to, to storytell? Is it your ability, ability to advocate? Is it your ability just to empathize? Is it your ability to sit and listen to people and their problems? Whatever it is, I would tell you to turn that up a little bit more and bring it bring it more to the table because in actuality, it's not about the table anyway because if we remove the table, we'll really start to understand that every single person matters and that as long as every single person matters, then my neighbor matters, my sister matters, my brother matters, the person that doesn't look like me matters. It doesn't matter if they don't have my same values or beliefs, they matter. Why? Because they have inherent worth and dignity. What do you 
table to the table. And I started to see, man, why I could bring my ability to tell stories and really meet people and befriend people. So I know Virgil. Virgil is not somebody that just comes and grabs things out of a closet. I know his, I know his hopes, his fears, his struggles, his likes, his dislikes. And we forget sometimes that people have preferences. And people have choices and people bring something to the table themselves. See, when volunteers come and serve with us, our volunteers, we ensure that they are getting something from the people that they are coming to serve. Because we have to remove this, this distance, right? And thinking like we are coming to give somebody something else and they have no worth and value to give back to us. That's, that's a lot. Virgil will sit down with you and talk to you about gardening. Virgil will sit down and talk to you about uh, how he was in business. Virgil will tell you things that will even inspire you. And I learned that Virgil only needed a pair of boots um, to start work. I know the stories of people like Chris. When I was on a journey from um, Atlanta all the way to, to Memphis earlier this year, it's a 300 plus mile walk. I met this guy, Chris, he's a veteran in our country. Um, he was passing me, I was passing him, I was on Veterans Memorial Highway, to go figure, you know, <laughs> that's crazy. Like, and he, he I, I just, for some reason, we just crossed paths and I said, hey Chris, um, I said, hey bro, like, what's your name, Chris? And he tells me a story. He says, man, I was just praying for food for the last two days. I was in the middle of a walk. I took time to be with him, to talk to him, to understand, and also leverage my network and share the story. Uh, the very next day, a volunteer drove all the way out there, like over an hour, to drive Chris to a VA. We had made a contact here locally and got him an interview. Uh, within two days, Chris had gotten an interview and had been placed in housing just because uh, I just chose to stop and acknowledge that he existed. Here's the thing. We've got to start showing people that is, yeah, institutions can help, but the larger army of people are everyday people. Amen. Everyday people can bring something to the table like the volunteer, we had built this little uh, tiny home, uh, and we look, use RVs now to provide temporary shelter, um, to like literally use her net for research to find Ronald's family members. He had been out of touch with his family for over 30 years. And this lady comes and she says, I want to give something. I don't know what to give, but oftentimes people don't know what to give because they've never been taught that their gifts, their what they bring to the table can actually help somebody else move forward. And so I said, where, where are you good at? She says, research. <clears throat> I said, well, this guy hasn't been in touch with his family in over 30 years. And uh, Ronald found his family and was able to get off the streets. Or what about Mark, uh, who last, he stayed on our property um, for a little over a year. He was in corporate America, um, like literally, got depressed, became homeless. I met Mark like digging in a dumpster behind our center. We have a center, a facility too. And uh, instead of calling the police, I asked him his story. That led to us giving him a place to stay, which led to us on an eight month, month journey to get his identification. It took eight months and a lawyer to get his birth certificate. The waiting period was fierce. You talk about peaks and valleys and hope and having his hope shattered. Why is it taking so long, he would say. And finally, I said, man, if you continue to go the distance, I would too. I literally launched a campaign called Higher Mark, where I stood downtown in the heart of the city in front of CNN uh, with a big sign on that said Higher Mark. Uh, and we passed out his resumes. I got him in a suit. I said, man, I'm going to get you higher. Watch. And so uh, it started to spread on social media. Um, a thousand people reached out trying to give him a job. Finally, we landed, and a, a DNK suit said he gave him 
not only suits, but brought them in the next day and hired them for his first job. Um, he stayed there working two weeks. Uh, we got him a job for Christmas, last Christmas. Uh, about two weeks later, uh, Sage International reached out and gave him a job back into uh, corporate America. He's no longer on the street. It's good to clap. What you bring to the table matters. That also um, leads me to, to this. Uh, focus on the piece that you bring, not the entire puzzle. Um, so many people get overwhelmed because they're, man, it's so much going on. You know, the news hits you there, social media hits you there, posts from other people that make you angry hits you here. And you're like finding yourself in the middle and, and you're trying to do this work. And what I want to remind you is that you have to focus on the peace that you bring because there are many other people all around the country who are doing the same type of work, who are fighting on behalf of those who are voiceless, those who are impoverished, those who are living on the margins. And you know what happens when a lot of pieces come Come together, we create the puzzle. That's it. That's it. Focus on your piece. What is your piece to this puzzle? Is it the nonprofit that you're working on? Is it the diapers that you're doing every single week for people and children who are in, in need of access to these resources? What is the piece that you're supposed to be focused on? See, what happens is we lose focus when we start focusing on the bigger picture, thinking that we have to do it all ourselves. You don't have to do everything yourself. All you have to do is continue to do what you've been called and graced to do in this earth and let me tell you the person in front of you will change the child in front of you will change why because you are giving your life to something that matters and that's your peace I, I remember one of the pieces um, that led me to sleeping on top of this bus for an entire month there's a church random church that donates this bus because nobody wanted this old church bus to our organization. And at the time, the piece that was in front of me was like meeting people one by one and helping people transition off the streets. And just by one, one, one by one approach, we led over 200 people off the streets. And so it was this guy named uh, Leonard uh, at this gas station I met. And I just asked him a question, he had trash hanging from his beer. I said, Leonard, if you had one wish, man, what would that wish be? He says, I wish I could be made over. I said, what do you mean? He was talking about trash hanging from his beer and not being able to have access to a shower or something and so forth. And we had a church bus. We were 10 miles away from the nearest shelter. And then even if he were to go there, he would probably have to wait and have his dignity not affirmed and so I thought about how could I leverage this church bus to do something. And so we turned, I slept on this bus, homeless in this tent for a month straight on top of the bus. Hardly came down. Uh, we wanted to turn this bus into Atlanta's first mobile makeover unit, uh, where we provided grooming on site. Uh, people could come on and literally be transformed. And we could use this as a conduit uh, to connect people to further resources. One of the cool stories is, Jamil's story, is when Jamil started volunteering with us, he was 27 years old. I met him, and he was a volunteer barber. I'm almost finished. Um, but um, he's volunteering with us. I asked Jamil, I said, Jamil, man, why are you volunteering? He says, because my dad's homeless. I haven't seen him in 10 years. He said, um, one day I'm hoping that I can uh, run into my father and he did. Jamil ran into his father um, on this bus, was able to give his own dad a makeover, and his dad, from this haircut, was able to reunite with him and his brother, and we, and we got him off the streets. Um, the types of things that happen on this bus are incredible. Uh, we get a chance uh, to see people come on 
and literally be transformed. Um, I want to leave you with let the stories you see uh, push you to keep going and giving. Um, when I look at disparity in our, our city, I don't allow it to overwhelm me to the point where I become paralyzed. Because it's very easy to allow the problem to paralyze you. I like to focus on what can I do? You gotta be a doer. What can I do to make uh, the world a better place around me? I gotta start doing it. And lastly, uh, the last campaign, uh, one of our new campaigns we're working on, I, uh, here recently, I, I, was, I was passing by the shipping container, man, I was like, oh, that's cool. So I climbed up on top of this shipping container because um, I like to take risks. And so <laughs> I posted this photo and I was like, I, I really believe that in the near future, one of our next campaigns will involve a shipping container. And so, <laughs> yeah, a shipping container. And so people started reaching out. Uh, we had this group out serving, and I, I just shared the vision of the shipping container. And one one couple in the group said, hey, we'll buy the shipping container. I was like, oh, OK. And they bought the shipping container and donated it to our organization. And then we painted it red, because uh, red is a cool color. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the idea with the shipping container is I started to, to find out that um, more and more as uh, gentrification happens, all of these things happen to like forget the voices of those uh, who matter most. Um, like they they are forgotten. And I started to see all of these museums across the country, and, and like there is no museum for homelessness. And so we're going to convert the shipping container to Atlanta's first museum that represents homelessness, and we're going to call it. Museum. It's going to have virtual reality in there and uh, all types of technology to expand the space. So imagine being transported on a corner. We, we just got our prototype back. And literally, you're on the corner standing next to somebody uh, who's asking for money. And you look over, and then somebody walks across the street up on you and starts talking to you. But before you know it, you start to see them as a home, uh, 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 not as a homeless person, but as a person. And before you know it, you're like, whoa, this is somebody that I would normally just walk past and not take the time to understand the story. Or imagine being transported under a bridge or transported in an abandoned house, and you have to look around and see what it's like uh, to live in these conditions. Um, and so it's going to be, uh, it's the brand market. It's a, it creates an interval. It's a personal understanding for love people. And it's going to be a museum uh, that creates this immersive experience. And the cool thing about the shipping container is that we get a chance to be disruptive with it. We can take it to people because the container itself is homeless. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to tell the stories of people who are oftentimes forgotten and misunderstood, but also use it as a way of mobilizing the people that come through the container if they go through to help us to create more sustainable housing for the individuals that we're in a relationship with. But also, we'll give people a chance to actually meet the people. Because I imagine the guides who would give the guided tour of this museum will be people who've actually come out of the predicament. So in closing, I would tell you um, to pass along what you have to others. There's so many people who are like dry matches. Catch yourself on fire uh, for what it is that you're doing, and then go stand next to somebody else uh, who needs to be on fire themselves. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>